Blast off. This meeting is being recorded. Hello, everybody. Uh, this Welcome to the Journalism's Roundtable. Uh, my name is Richard Prince. I write a column called Journalisms. That's journal-isms.com, which is about uh, diversity issues in the news business. And this Journalism's Roundtable is uh, kind of an extension of that. Uh, we've been meeting since 1999, a group of friends, a group of journalists, uh, maybe about uh, six or seven of us, maybe less than that, met in a restaurant to welcome, uh, wish a friend well who was leaving town. She said, no, we'll keep these going. And we have, we met in restaurants around DC um, until the pandemic. And then once the pandemic hit, we switched to Zoom and that enabled us to greatly increase the number of participants, meaning that people from around the world, basically, and, and around the country could join us, and they have. So welcome, and we also wanna welcome the people who are on Facebook. Um, uh, we, we should have a good session tonight, I hope. Uh, and then we were having another one later in the month. This was an extra that we put, put out because of the exigency of the news about Ukraine, Malcolm Mance, uh, volunteered to uh, to speak with us after having spent a a, um, a month in Ukraine. So we're, we'll, we're happy to have him, and we're happy to uh, have the people who we asked to join him on this on this session. So, uh, without further ado, oh, let me just mention we had a moment of silence on Sunday for Askia Muhammad, who had been in a, a, a in attendance at our roundtables. For those who don't know Askia, he was a, a columnist for the final call uh, of the Nation of Islam and the Washington Informer. And he was the news director of WPFW, uh, which is the Pacifica station in Washington, DC. It's a progressive, uh, peace-loving station. Uh, what do they call us? Jazz and justice. In any case, uh, he passed away uh, about uh, 10 days ago. And uh, we are having, they are having a service for him. They have a name for him later on. But anyway, that uh, celebration of his life is going to take place on Saturday, this coming Saturday, March the 5th at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, uh, Eastern time. And it will be broadcast on WPFW, which is online at WPFWFM.org and also at, on WBAI which is the New York station for uh, the Pacifica network. So um, I just wanted to let people know about that in case you wanted to participate in that. Uh, we want to start off by lift, having a toast. We always like to have people who we can, we can uh, wish well. And uh, tonight we want to wish Aisha Roscoe well and have a toast to her uh, because Aisha, who is now a White House correspondent for NPR is moving up to become the host of Weekend Edition Sunday. And some of us, like Betty Ann Williams and myself, remember Ayesha when she was at the Hilltop. <laughs> many, many years ago, uh, she was the editor of Howard University's newspaper. And look at her now. <laughs> so let's, let's have a toast to Ayesha Roscoe and wish her well at her new position at NPR. All right. Congratulations, Ayesha. Congratulations, Ayesha. Uh, now, tell us something about what the future holds as far as you can see. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Like, I, first of all, thank you. This is, is such an honor. I, I remember, you know, uh, you know, talking to you guys, uh, to Richard and to Betty Ann back when I was at the Hilltop. That's right. Uh, so this is <laughs> so this is pretty amazing to me. I'm really excited to be taking over Weekend Edition Sunday. Um, and to be hosting and, and you know, I hope uh, to be able to bring a wide variety of stories and, and to, um, you know, try to, you know, reach out to, and cover those stories and communities that don't always get covered um, and to tell stories that don't always get told. Uh, and so that that is what my hope and my desire is. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. Um, and I, I so appreciate you guys uh, toasting me. Here, here. <laughs> now, I forgot to mention that um, we have to um, 
there's Peggy Lewis saying she, she you also had taught at Howard, uh, wishing you well as well in the chat. That we we need we should make um, maximum use of the chat room, since the purpose of these sessions is to network uh, and to learn. And uh, uh, one of the best ways to network in this format is by using the chat room. You can send messages for everybody, or you can send them to particular people. Uh, so we can do that. Now let's go to. Uh, I don't see Malcolm yet. Let's see. But Remy is here. Uh, let me keep looking. Oh, there you I'm are, Malcolm. There, there you are. Well, listen. I'm gonna. I'm going to ask who wants to go first. Remy, do you want to have something that you want to say particularly? Or do you want to just comment on what Malcolm is saying? Follow him. Yeah, I think I think you said Malcolm is actually he's just back from Ukraine. He's been there right. physically in the past month. Yeah, so maybe maybe we could listen to him first and then add, you know, I'd comment on what he says and then come in after that. Okay, very good. All right, Malcolm, the floor is yours. Of course, we right. know Malcolm very well at this round table because he's been with us a few times and uh uh people always comment afterwards what a great session that was. And now, uh, uh, now he's here with us again, and I, I thank him for being here. Malcolm, tell us what you want to tell us. Well, thanks for inviting me, and, and uh, you know, I'm glad I can have this opportunity to speak to particularly journalists of color. Um, I, I found the experience that I had in Ukraine not only interesting in you know what I found and discovered over there with regards to how the people of Ukraine live, but I've got some really enlightening views on U.S. news media while uh -oh. I was there also. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're all people of color. So we have a very, we have a different perspective informed, uh, you know, on the basis of our experiences. And, uh, <laughs> and it's, for those of you who don't know, if you don't see me on MSNBC, despite the fact that I'm a member of the National Association of Black Journalists and a member of the National Press Club, I am not a journalist, right? I'm a spy who comments on television. So there's that's a really big difference there. Even though I write books, technically, I guess that makes me it makes me part of that. But um, but at this round table, I'm a journalist. So um, I just came back from a month in Ukraine. Uh, I went to Ukraine for the specific purpose of uh, our terrorism think tank or our asymmetric warfare think tank, the Terror Asymmetrics Project on Strategy, Tactics, and Radical Ideologies, also known as Tapestry. We study asymmetric warfare, which is, you know, warfare that's done in a form of judo, where you know, uh, an, a, an attacker's strength is turned into a weakness and where a weakness of a defender is turned into a strength against an attacker. So Ukraine had been setting itself up for almost two months for us to really see that something was going on that was very, very different from what we had been looking at before. Um, for those of you who don't know, there's a, or, and you certainly should, especially if you're in print media, um, uh, he's been on television a lot recently because I've, I've managed to get him onto MSNBC and CNN, uh, a, a journalist by the name of Terrell Starr, Terrell Jermaine mm -hmm. Starr, and uh, he's writing for Rolling Stone right now, but he was a Peace Corps volunteer in Georgia and uh, back in the, you know, uh, the mid 2000s. Uh, early 2000s, and he was there for the Russian invasion of Georgia in South Ossetia. Uh, he speaks Georgian. Then he became a Fulbright scholar and got a scholarship to study in Ukraine. And he lived, he's been living since 2009 in Ukraine half the year, every year. So, um, you know, he's a, and he speaks Russian and Ukrainian. So, he is a real expert in this. He runs the Black Diplomats podcast. I do it all the time. Great podcast. And in fact, he's in Kiev right now. We spent the last month together. Uh, he's in Kiev right now wearing my body armor. So oh, really? he's, running, he's running around. He has PTSD now because he finally got bombarded by rockets from a Russian strike aircraft while he was embedded with a Ukrainian militia the other day. And, I, you know, he goes, oh, I think I have PTSD now. And I go, yes, you do. <laughs> Welcome to my world. Wow. Uh, you know. He's uh, been on Twitter also, by the way. Yeah, he's on Twitter. He's awesome. I mean, he gets tens of thousands of comments now because he is truly the African-American 
perspective on what's going on there. More importantly, he educated us all on something we didn't know. There is an Afro-Ukrainian society there. What? I didn't of know people who are, who are children of mixed race marriages in Ukraine. Wow. And in, in fact, one of the top uh, Olympic wrestlers, gold medalist Olympic wrestler, was an Afro-Ukrainian who is now a member of parliament. He's this massive rock looking guy. And uh, you know, his father was Nigerian, his mother's Ukrainian. Um, and so there's an entire society there, which you would see because as he explains that, you know, Africans have been in, have been in Ukraine for, for centuries, you know, going back well into the court of Catherine the Great, who would come there and build churches left and right. So- Well, listen, uh, I can't, I can't, I have to interrupt now because people have been talking and about how are the Nigerians being treated in Ukraine now? Yeah, uh, there have been stories about that, about how they've been turned away from train stations, yeah, trying to escape, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I, I actually, you know, I'm, I'm in direct communication with the Zelensky government. Uh, I, I went to the Donbass battlefront with the Minister of Information. His actual title is the Minister of Culture and Information Policy, and I said, "Hey, you need to kill this story right here," which started really becoming popular on a, a video which was posted. And it was amplified by Russia today. <laughs> so, you know, the Russians picked up on it very quickly and decided to drive a wedge uh, with the Ukrainians. Was there racism going on? I wouldn't doubt it at all. Um, however, the, the video as it shows it also shows that they were prioritizing women, women and children who happened to be white. And it turns out there is a humanitarian policy. That, that's, you know, the lifeboat rule. Women and children are allowed on trains that are evacuating first. And there's actually a big, not just Nigerian, but there's a big Af African and South Asian community in Ukraine who are studying at trade schools. Uh, I know in the city of Chernobyl, I hadn't seen more than three Afro-Ukrainians or Africans at all in Kiev, because Kiev's large, city of 5 million people. Uh, when I went to the city of Chernobyl, which is east of Lviv, that's where all the trade schools are. And I saw maybe 50 in my first hour. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, you know, where did all you guys come from? You know, uh, it was quite surprising. And then th they had no problem. Everybody's out shopping, walking around. And, you know, um, Ukrainians are actually very, very intensely friendly people. Um, and so could there possibly be racism, you know, with this thing getting on the train? Yes, uh, I, that happens everywhere. I've worked around wars all over the world. I've seen it in sub-Saharan Africa, right? Whoever has the money gets on the train first. So, you know, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that, except for the location that they were saying, trying to get across the Polish border in some circumstances. That place is absolute safe, 100% safe. It is not like trying to get a train in the city of Kiev, right? Where it's mm -hmm. really all every you know all man for himself, right? Uh, where people fight to get through the train doors, and um, so uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs approached that. I, I told the Minister of Information, I was like, "Hey, you need to kill this," and the Foreign Ministry put out a statement related to that because. The Russians had taken it up with other governments and the Nigerian government had complained. And their comment was, their, their, uh, report, their post was, is that there will be no discrimination. He says the foreign ministry of Ukraine has requested the relevant agencies of Ukraine to step up support for foreign citizens, including students wishing to return to their home countries or move to third countries due to the Russian military invasion. In particular, the Ukrainian government is doing its best to facilitate their passage at the state border, which has become overwhelmed with a massive influx of people fleeing Russia's armed aggression. Temporary volunteer assistance points have been set up at the border to provide foreign students with food and cater to their humanitarian, other humanitarian needs. As active fighting continues, we also believe it, it is more secure at this time for foreign students to stay in their places of residence in Ukraine. And that's principally because they're in the city of Chernobyl and in the Southwest in Ivano-Frankivsk. 
And yes, there are military bases near there that were struck, but those bombs are not for the students. They're not for anyone who is not on that base sitting under a bomb, right? As I say, you'll, in war zones, you'll hear loud noises and bright flashes, but they're generally not for you. So I know in Ivano Frankic, it's a huge medical school community. Uh, when I was there, it was, you know, everyone that I saw on the street who was of color was from Southwest Asia, you know, uh, mm -hmm. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Uh, I got and, another question here from the chat here. I don't say it keep interrupting, but it's, it's on the same subject. Sure. And uh, Craig, uh, with, uh, Harry Herndon would like to know whether there are black fighters also among the Ukrainians. Uh, well, it says among the foreign fighters. Uh, yeah. Not yet, because... Now there are Afro-Ukrainian fighters because okay. that minister I was telling you about is a volunteer. He's running around with body armor and weapon. Gold medal, Olympic gold medalist, right? Looks like, you know, a very dark-skinned Ivan Drago from Rocky IV, right? Mm -hmm. And he's on the battle line. Uh, right. This is their country. Mm -hmm. Now, foreign fighters, there are very few, if any, foreign fighters in the Ukrainian army. The ones that are there are British and American. They're on contract. They have announced that they would be, um, uh, oh, this is an interesting note. Somebody said that there are African students who were turned away from the Polish and Hungarian borders, as well as efforts to block them from getting on trains. The question is, were they turned away by the Polish or were they turned away by the Ukrainians? Um, another thing that they mentioned is you, you do have to have documentation to cross the border because the United Nations in Poland and Hungary have not established an official uh, humanitarian cordon sanitaire. And as you know, a cordon sanitaire is when they just open the gates. It says turned away by Poles and Hungarians at the border. Well, you can't stop them, right? The Poles and the Hungarians are their own nations. Uh, and until they establish these cord humanitarian cordon sanitaires, where they literally will just open the gates and process you in the refugee camp instead of sitting there looking for your passport and stamping your passports. And I know it's an important subject because as I said, I saw it, uh, who was it? Uh, Roland Martin had come to me and asked me about it and uh, then I was on Jesse Jackson's show on Sunday and off air Santita Jackson asked me about it and I was like, all right, all right, now this is making too much infiltration but it was amplified by Russia today mm -hmm. who saw an opportunity. And, uh, but you can't stop the Poles and you can't stop the Hungarians, right? Uh, but those people at the Polish and Hungarian borders are safe. There are no airstrikes occurring at those borders. There's no war anywhere near those borders. You'd have to travel eight hours to the east into Kiev to find the war. Although sometimes there are airstrikes miles from the city of Lviv and, and all those places. So, um, you know, and I'm sure they'll all be processed out. According to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they've now made it a priority to get them out of the country. Uh, back to the thing about foreign fighters, the Ukrainians have established a, a militia group that they're calling a, or a territorial home guard group that they're calling the Ukrainian International Legion. I didn't like that name. I told them they should call it the Foreign Legion and be done with it. And um, and they are taking volunteers from the West. Hey, I might be an officer in the International Legion. I may be running the International Legion at this point, right? Uh, you know, MSNBC doesn't uh, change re-up re my contract. So uh, <laughs> don't laugh. So uh, we'll we'll see about that. So what's happening in Ukraine? Why did I go there? Uh, besides the fact that Terrell Starr was there and he was like, this place is awesome. I'm doing tourism. I'm bringing wool clothes out of the Carpathian Mountains and we're going to start exporting them and selling them in Harlem, uh, which was okay. the plan as of a week ago. Wow. <laughs> right? uh, and Ukraine is a paradise of tourism. I couldn't believe it. I was like, how does no one know about this place? The city of Kiev is very modern, very Western. I've seen more Teslas in Kiev than I've seen in Hollywood, and that's saying something. Mm. So um, it's, it's very advanced. Sometimes I couldn't tell whether I was in Stuttgart or Lyon or the suburbs of Paris, depending on where I was. Like Lviv, mm. Lviv is just like being in sections of Vienna. 
So it's a, a really beautiful country too. clean. Okay, for those of you who have ever been to Ireland, you notice how they dump all their trash on the side of every road. And Ireland's sort of a trash pit, not Ukraine. And it does have the second lowest GDP in Europe, but they lead a middle-class lifestyle with that GDP, you know? Yeah, six. somebody says they had 60 McDonald's. Yeah, <laughs> right next to my hotel. So, so much for that theory that two countries with McDonald's won't go to war, right? So... Um, <laughs> But I went there to do an analysis of the Russian order of battle that was assembling around Ukraine. And the most important thing that I know from my intelligence career is you have to travel the roads of an invasion. You have to see and get a feel of how do the highways feel? How many lanes are there? How many gas stations are there? By the way, Ukraine has the finest convenience. Wait, let me rephrase that. Had the finest convenience stores and gas stations I've seen anywhere in the world. They have, you know, French brie cheese next to Azerbaijani cognac, next to Armenian canned cooked ostrich. I'm not joking. <laughs> and cans of horse meat, if you like that, you know, uh, it's just, it, they were international. They were a European Union festival. And more Jack Daniels than I can shake a stick at. I don't know why. I <laughs> love Jack Daniels there. They actually have displays of a bottle of Jack Daniels wrapped with a six pack of Coke. So, right. so go, there you have it. Um, so we analyzed um, the invasion routes that the Russians would have to take, starting in the Chernobyl Preserve, um, uh, the, the approaches to Chernihiv to the northeast of Kiev, Sumy to the northeast. Uh, Kharkiv to the east. Uh, I went down to the Donetsk battlefront uh, down there. I didn't get to Luhansk, but I did go to Donetsk, which requires you to fly in. It's very dangerous. Um, and then um, all approaches. I went to every city except for U Odessa. And that's because I had been to Odessa at one time when I was in the military. So I didn't need to drive that route because it's a straight line from Odessa to Kiev. But then we evaluated all of these cities and the evacuation routes that NGOs and journalists would have to take going all the way from Kiev to the west to Carpathia. And then analyzing that with the overlay of the Russian invasion and realizing very quickly that you wouldn't be able to take a train after a while when the Russians start figuring it out and they start blowing up those trains full of civilians, which is coming. Uh, and the highways, the M06 from Kiev to, to Zutomir, to Rivna, to Lviv, just is going to turn rock solid into cars. And then the Russian army is going to take that highway because they needed it to get into Kiev. And that happened. So, you know, it was very important that I see the ground, that I feel the terrain and then evaluate the Russian invasion there. Uh, I did do some commentary on it uh, when I was there, but as you know, with most news media organizations, if you're not a reporter for that organization, like MSNBC, off the record, right? Everybody <laughs> just remember this. Anything I say about MSNBC is completely off the record. Well, you know, we're on what? Facebook too. So. Yeah. Uh, are we on Facebook? Okay, then I won't say anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, but for the most part, news organizations have their teams for these events. Right. And I wasn't there as part of a news organization. I was there as a part of a, uh, a asymmetric warfare analysis group, which we predicted every invasion route and the flow of the invasion. And, and we've been spot on. It was myself, Chris Sampson, my chief of research, who also did all our camera work out there. We met the commanding general of the Ukrainian army, General Sersky. Uh, the commanding general down at Donetsk in the battlefront. Uh, and, um, and one thing that we came away with that was absent in news media coverage for a month was that for some strange reason, the news media seemed to forget that Ukraine had an army. So they only, they only showed video of the Russian propaganda videos of Russian forces on battle exercises. They only spoke about the Russian army. They only spoke about how fast the Russians would take 
Ukraine. They only spoke about the numbers of soldiers there. And I kept sitting there thinking, you know, I was just with the army yesterday, you know, where they've been fighting for eight years. And, you know, it's like you guys don't even believe that this country has the capacity to defend itself. And I learned a few things. First off is that Ukrainians by their own um, by their own admission, are really stubborn, hard-headed people. You wouldn't see that until you get in a circumstance where it requires their stubbornness. And invading Ukraine is one of those circumstances. Um, you know, otherwise, they're actually very, very, very nice people. Um, but they take this invasion, they took it seriously when the first bomb dropped. Prior to that, they believed that it wasn't going to happen. And they, they, they weren't like putting an ostrich putting their head in the sand. They were more like, we'll deal with it when it comes. That sort of uh, Middle Eastern fatalistic attitude, right? Inshallah, right? God willing. If, if a bomb falls, then God willed it to fall. So we, we analyzed that, uh, how they were carrying out their attack and came up with some very uh, interesting suppositions that have now been borne out every day that I'm on air because U.S. news media is going by U.S. intelligence. U.S. intelligence is going by the best case scenario of the enemy's, um, you know, most likely decisions and most dangerous decisions, right? But what's happened is, is that the Russian army was given a level of competence that it apparently does not have. And that the main invasion forces were actually their special forces and their VDV, the paratroopers, really ed up professional, you know, soldiers. Uh, and that the main force army, the logistics forces that were following on, the tank forces, in many circumstances, did not know they were invading Ukraine. They were just pointed in a direction. The officers may have known about it. Some of these tankers didn't know about it. There's a famous video of the first captives in Ukraine was a reconnaissance platoon. Uh, they stopped at a gas station because they were like, oh, we can go get drinks <laughs> in their invasion. And when they got taken captive and were shot at, they were like, hey, why are you shooting at us? And they go, well, you're invading us. And they go, no, we're on exercise. And he goes, you're aware you're in Ukraine, right? And they're like, no, we're in Belarus. <laughs> it goes, I got some bad news for you, bros. And they were, they were just literally flabbergasted that they did not know that this was not an exercise. They had their phones taken away wow. from them and were issued ammunition, which you do on major exercises. So the main force of the Russian army is not a willing army. They are not showing the competency or even the amount of movement and shock that they need. Some people are not performing their task, which is why many armor vehicles are running out of fuel on the highways and they're abandoning them. When they run out of fuel, guy goes, they take their backpacks, they take their guns and they walk back to wherever they came from. And they're like, well, we're going to be ambushed on the road anyway. And the vehicle's there and somebody can recover it. Yeah, the Ukrainians are recovering it. You know, um, mm. also, let me talk about the weather. You know, everybody talks about the famous Russian winter that did Napoleon in. Well, Mother Earth has something to say about the invasion of Ukraine. The entire time I was there, I live in upstate New York now. Uh, we oh, had temperatures God. down to minus 17 here. Mm. Um, and I don't mean far upstate. I'm just near Albany. Um, on average, around 20 to 25 degrees here throughout this winter. We had snow. We had just eight inches of snow the other day. Um, when I went to Ukraine, I expected that plus. I expected a Montreal-level winter, 10 to 15 degrees colder. What we found is um, their temperatures have been hovering in the mid-30s. And at one point, it got to 52 degrees one day as a high. And we were saying, what, what is going on here? This is not a Russian winter. So there is no permafrost or frozen fields for the Russian army to ride on. That's why you have this massive column on one road, because they can't go off the roads. It's, it's a mud festival. 
yeah, global warming, right? It's <laughs> Mother Earth has something to say about the Russian invasion and that it's you're gonna die on tarmac roads because those lend to ambushes. So when you see those big arrows that are pointing into, you know, from Russia and Belarus into Ukraine, ignore them because they are not territory taken. They are only, they are thin pencil lines of red going down the roads. They only control those roads. Um, that being said, uh, the Russian invasion did, it kicked off pretty much as I had predicted. I had been on Twitter saying, hey, this is what you're gonna see. The major cyber attack didn't occur because we think the Russians wanted to capture the Ukrainian cyber capability, Ukrainian internet and IT capability whole so that they could use it, keep government infrastructure up in that. So they didn't throw any worms or cyber attacks in there like we thought. And then on the other hand, um, they didn't blast the cellular structure physically, which we thought would go in the first hours. We thought they would knock down every cellular tower, they would start jamming, um, you know, uh, and, and all these other places. Um, and, and, and would really just start knocking down the ability for the leave the Ukrainians to communicate. They left it up because it turns out they needed that to communicate amongst their own forces. So they wanted to capture Ukraine's entire communication structure whole. And only today did they really start hitting things. Like in the middle of Kiev, there's this giant lattice TV tower that's been there for, you know, since the 60s. And it's almost been like, you know, like Stuttgart's tower or Frankfurt's tower, where you could see this giant tower. Well, today they struck it finally at D plus six, right? And that made me believe they're frustrated. They're frustrated. They don't know what the hell to hit. So they're hitting objects of significance, not objects of importance, because just about everybody uses satellite TV. And that's not where the TV channels were coming from, right? So very bizarre, or internet television. Um, so some of the questions that come up here, uh, let me get to those, because for the most part, the summation of this is the Ukrainian army is holding its own. There are places where people are saying, hey, they're going to cut from the south and they're going to envelop from the north and trap all the Ukrainian forces in eastern Ukraine. Well, I tweeted out today, the distance between those two points is the distance between New York City and Richmond, Virginia, and as wide as the Atlantic Ocean to West Virginia. That's Eastern Ukraine. So nobody's gonna be coming from the North and the South and cutting people off unless you got a million man army, and they don't. This was supposed to be one of these armies that just ran in there. You know, they thought the Ukrainians wouldn't fight. They thought Zelensky would get on an airplane and fly to Poland. They would put Yanukovych back in government and declare it a new Russian republic. How they missed that, I mean, that the Ukrainians were going to fight to the last man and woman is beyond me. They, they, they themselves um, are, are, had, had deluded themselves into believing this will be easy. I am one of the few analysts, I am the only analyst right now in media that will say this, and I said this two days ago, I think the Ukrainians are going to win this war. Because now that they have the resources coming from the West, their ammunition resupply, their anti-tank resupply is coming, the Russians are marching in a way that is going to get them slaughtered. So now let me go back onto that. The question that somebody had asked a little, for, a little earlier about um, the 40 mile column, right? That's to the Northwest of Kyiv. Um, the city of Kyiv has been attacked by strike aircraft and a ballistic missile, but there have only been two armed incursions into the city. And in both instances, um, one was where they had pretended to be Ukrainian army soldiers had dressed in these uniforms had come into the city with these anti-air missile launchers and were immediately detected and wiped out by the locals. And I mean, when I say wiped out, Kiev is the size of Chicago. Only imagine Chicago with 20, 30 times the number of 20-story 
concrete block apartment complexes ringing the city. That's what they, the Russians had built in that city. So there's not two or three story buildings like we had in Baghdad or Najaf in Iraq where we could just zoom by and you had to shoot from the second story. These tanks have to go in between 10 and 15, 20 story buildings which are surrounding them and every person with a gun, a rock, or a flower pot is throwing it at them. And so it lends to them being ambushed and wiped out. And the two incursions had that. The second incursion was done by Russian special forces and their airborne forces. It was done at night. They got deep into the city near the zoo. But the street that they were on, Prehameni Street, I had driven down it many times. And I thought, I'd never want to be on this street. <laughs> you know, this is Ambush Alley. To the left is the zoo and a park, including the Babi Yar Holocaust Memorial. But it's a sloping park that slopes up like that to a flat roadway, which is four lanes. And then to the right of that roadway are these 10 and 15 story apartment complexes, right? looking down onto that roadway. So you put the guys with the rockets in the park shooting up and the guys in the building shooting down and it's a death sentence. And so they had gotten like 10 or 15 of these armored vehicles in there and a couple of hundred soldiers and they were just waiting for them. It was a deliberate ambush that allowed them into the city into the perfect kill zone and they wiped them out, <laughs> all of them. Uh, I, and people are like, oh, my God, and if you watch MSNBC or CNN or Fox, it was like major battles raging in downtown Kiev. Yes, it would look like that. It would look like the Russians had gotten into the city and were really getting in there. No, it was a deliberate allowance of those forces in. And they were ambushed in the perfect spot that you could ambush somebody. No animals, animals at the zoo were harmed. You know, and it was just, I mean, I kept thinking about that park. It's just like, they won't see you if you're in the woods because you're below them in your little grade and you can shoot rockets right up the bottom of these tanks. Horrible. So those are the only two times the Russian forces got into Kiev. And then someone started reporting that the city was surrounded because Russian television had reported that they were surrounding the city. They're only there in two locations, and someone asked about that. Coming down north from the Chernobyl Preserve, which is radioactive, but they have vehicles that can handle that level of radiation. And then from the northeast, they went right to where we knew that they would go, which was an airport called Hotemel Airport, which is actually, uh, it belonged to the Antonov Air Airline Company, the one that made the largest jet in the world, the largest cargo jet in the world, the Miriam, the Dream which was destroyed when they flew helicopter forces and landed on that base. That base was taken by, is not a base, an airport. That airport was taken by Chechenian special forces who were loyal to Putin and their commander, Maskadov, or I believe his name was. And they brought in this, this evil looking Chechen character who's their commanding general. And they fought for that airport. It went back and forth into each other's hands. Finally, the Chechens were surrounded and they wiped them out and killed the Chechenian Special Forces general in charge of that mission. Those are the only troops that seem to want to fight for Putin. The Special Forces who are really getting their asses handed to them because everybody in Ukraine wants to kill them. But only some Russian forces want to fight. So how do you win the battle <laughs> and one side doesn't even really want to be there. And the other side literally wants to cut your testicles off and, and make you consume them in your dying day moments. Um, let me, let me, let me stop for a minute here. And uh, uh, Ishmael had a number of questions just going to read. So I want to give him a chance to ask those. Should I call him Ishmael? <laughs> you set me up. That. <laughs> you set me up. <clears throat> yeah, Mark, Ukrainian. That's Tennessee Reed. <laughs> yeah, Malcolm, I watched you on a Stephanie Miller show. Oh yeah, and you predicted about a month ago that the uh, Ukrainians needed 
javelins and night goggles. Yeah. Where would the Ukrainian position be if the Pentagon had, uh, you know, taken your advice, number one? And number two, I noticed that the uh, mainstream correspondents are broadcast from five-star hotels, probably in the, middle, in the midst of going to the bar, taking, you know, trips. To I don't even want to tell you. Okay. Al Jazeera goes to the front. Yeah. You wish they're alive. Let- let me, Al Jazeera always does that. As a matter of fact, I, I remember being in Baghdad and um, our compound was hit by a mortar that was supposed to hit the green zone. And boom, Al Jazeera is there in like less than a minute. And I thought, you know, I could tell Al Jazeera right now that they were off by 300 meters. <laughs> you know, and these Iraqis would be like, 300 meters, raise the borders a little more. But I didn't want the compound to be hit. Um, I can tell you, yes, most major journalist organizations, uh, CNN is set up in the Intercontinental, which is very nice, right next to, because they have St. Martin's Monastery, or St. Michael's Monastery right behind them as the backdrop. The other one is the Hyatt, which is across the street, where you get another angle of St. Michael's Monastery or St. Sophia Monastery uh, Church uh, around there. Um, and then in Lviv, which is a really luxury town, you know, the Vienna Hotel, the Wien Hotel, uh, or in, near the opera is where most of those people are there. So it's pretty sweet, pretty sweet job, right? Uh, but, you know, you are reporting from there and people are going out in the streets and, um, and interviewing people and seeing the battlefront. I mean, Terrell Stars was out there the other day, you know, and I, like I said, I left my armor and helmet with him, told him how to change his clothes into dark clothes and, you know, and have that big press badge everywhere, including in the window of the car and everything. And he did, and he's, you know, still got caught up in the battle. So people have to be careful. Um, What was your other part of your question? You said a month ago that- uh, Ah, stingers and night veil. Right. Javelins and night vision. Right. Uh, the U.S. government did. Every day that I was there, there were one to two C-17s landing with Javelin and Stinger missiles. Uh, they have night vision. Um, you know, the, one thing about the, the Ukrainians, here's why I think they could win this war. Besides the fact that they not only got a good capacity of weapons, they learn how to use them quickly They are highly motivated. They now have a pipeline of lots of new weapons. The big weapon that's being used north of Kyiv is the NLAW, N-L-A-W. It's the new light anti-tank weapon from the British. It's turning, it's blowing up the best of the newest Russian tanks that are being made. It's effective. And it's much cheaper than the Javelin. The Javelin's a $200,000 weapon. But when you shoot it, something's going to die right? You want to use that only on the biggest vehicles. Um, so the Ukrainians are, have good capacity. They know what they're doing. They have home court advantage. They take down all the highway signs, except that highway sign that says F-U. <laughs> and the one below it goes um, F-U, um, an obscenity about your mother, which is a very common phrase in Russian, right? For those of you who don't know, you you might. And then the, ne- the last one is welcome to hell, which is now their official motto of the Ukrainian army. Welcome to hell. And that's everywhere. <laughs> I mean, their psychological warfare on these Russians is working. Uh, wow. You know, there's a lot of defectors. So let me ask, um, let me ask mm-hmm. Gary Lee. He had, a, he had a question and then Craig sure. had a number of questions. Craig, sure, go ahead. Okay. Gary. So, um... <clears throat> hey, Gary. My biggest question, how are you doing? I haven't seen you in a uh, while. This is the last round table. Uh, how, how do you think that uh, Putin is going to fare um, as, the, as the Ukrainians continue to resist? And if your prediction that they win really happens? That's a good question. Because um, for the most part, I've met people that knew Putin. I met people that advised Putin. And almost to a person, uh, they said, since the beginning of COVID, he's been a sort of an alternate state of reality. 
He doesn't talk the way he used to talk. He doesn't act the way he used to act. He's much, much more paranoid. And people are saying that he's acting really more like Stalin than anybody else. And to carry out this war without understanding the consequences of it shows that his old ex-KGB consequence management skills are gone because you know, he had to know that the entire world would turn him into a pariah. But this is an old KGB guy. You know, when I wrote my book, Plot to Betray America, um, I went to his office in Dresden, where he started out as a baby human intelligence officer. And he loved manipulating people. He loved turning people into spies for, for, the, for the KGB. And all of that came crashing down when he was in his mid-40s. And now he's, you know, he's, he's a billionaire oligarch. And but this, this, the objective of taking back Ukraine is really Soviet. It's not. It's not Im even imperial. It's Soviet, unless he, you know, he feels that he's the new Catherine the Great, you know, or because he's definitely not Peter the Great. He's not building anything, right? There will never be a statue to Vladimir Vladimirovich, you know. In uh, kids won't learn about him in in textbooks. I think he'll be purged from history after a while, or, or as the guy who tried this new Stalinism, this neo-Stalinism. And, and then, you know, but there's never going to be a city named Putinburg. You know, you would thought that if he had invested in infrastructure, people, arts and culture, instead of being a KGB dictator, um, he would have something. He has no legacy. This is his legacy. Question is, does he want to take the world with him? Right? I mean, is he is he crazy enough to say, if I don't get Ukraine, I'm willing to nuke the U Ukrainian army? I don't know. I just hope that his chain of command below him, you know, at some point, if they find that he's unstable, that somebody remember the immortal words of a of a of the colonel to Captain Willard in the movie Apocalypse Now, terminate the colonel's command, <laughs> right? <laughs> Somebody may have to terminate Putin's command if he loses his mind. And right now, you, this invasion of Ukraine, he doesn't have enough forces to start to hold that country. He would have to mobilize a million Russians and create an occupation force because the last army that came through there that held the country was the Nazis. And it was 1.4 million soldiers. And then the Soviets counterattacked with 2 million soldiers. So how's he gonna do this with 100,000 when 80% of his combat effective force doesn't wanna be there? And the other 20% is getting their asses handed to them. So I hope that answers your question. All right, Craig Herndon. Please, please, please. Hey guys, um, it sounds as though um, the Russians didn't know what they were dealing with or they weren't prepared for a fight that they didn't recognize was coming. Mm -hmm. um, is that correct? I mean, that's kind of like a yes or no thing. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, that's exactly what you're hearing. Um, that, you know, the, the army, that, one of the things that we that became very apparent very quickly there was there was no casus belli there was no cause for the war and that u.s intelligence you know uh joe biden and u.s intelligence played a really great game i don't know if you've read the new york times reporting on this but according to them they had the entire battle plan last november cia you know, I don't know about you, if you guys know how sometimes human intelligence is very good. I remember one circumstance where the phrase, I'm going to start putting gold bars on the table and you tell me when you can't carry them out for the intelligence that they needed. I mean, you know, I've seen on occasion this where somebody was just like, well, you know, I have 200 pounds of gold bars. Here's the entire invasion plan and that the biden administration had made it clear to the russians we had it and we knew it and that you couldn't do it and in fact we went to the chinese knowing the chinese would tell the russians 
we have the plan. We know what you're going to do. We know you're going to try to invade in January. Um, and then it got pushed back into February when U.S. intelligence started going out and saying the Russians are making a fake film that there's going to be a, you know, a, a massacre. That film, by the way, came out. If those of you who weren't watching on Twitter, just look up, uh, what is it, fake film saboteurs. The Russians claimed that they had, ca had captured and had killed Polish-speaking saboteurs in Donetsk. Well, what the hell are they doing in Donetsk? <laughs> right? Why wouldn't they go down to Moldova, Transnistria, or Belarus and attack your forces? Why would they take a 16-hour car drive to go get murdered in Donetsk? So it's really hilarious that they're, they're, they're fake stories. And then they did this story of that there was a genocide in, in Luhansk and that they had found mass graves. And nobody believed it. It was all for the consumption of the Russian public. And to this day, no one knows why Putin has invaded Ukraine other than he wants Ukraine on the border. And it's not about NATO because most people miss this thing. He kept saying, I don't want NATO on my border. Right. But you got Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia and Poland on the Russian border. And they're all NATO nations. Mm. So that's out the window. Maybe it's you just want Ukraine back under the Soviet banner. Because this is Soviet. This isn't even, like I said, it's not even 19th century imperialist Russia. So okay. I'd like to point to that Betty Ann Williams. Okay. We had a number of questions. Betty Ann, are you there? Yeah, sorry about that. Talk about uh, what kind of retaliation Putin can muster to punish the United States, if anything significant is possible or likely. Well, of course, you know, people have made, made it pretty clear, and, and I've been saying this for years, I have been a huge advocate ever since they did the 2016 attack on the election uh, and helping Donald Trump. I've been an advocate for punishing Russia by going after their money. I, I call it a take they money school of business, right? Take their money seize their yachts. Well, now it's happened. Um, Russia is propped up by an oligarchy, which is the uber rich billionaires that Putin has allowed to become uber rich billionaires. And when you start taking away, you know, there is a billionaire, I'm not joking, who flies an executive jet from Moscow to Marseille, France or Nice, France, and has his croissants picked up every morning. Oh. And then flown back to Moscow so that he can say, I have fresh French croissants or baguettes at his table. This is cabillionaire money, right? This is yes. the oligarchy. Yes. Um, you know, and right now um, in Barcelona, and there may, they, they may have gotten underway, there were six mega yachts totaling almost a billion dollars just the value of those yachts. Actually, I think it was $1.2 billion because a, an ex-CIA officer lives in Barcelona and for fun, she's like, here's this guy's yacht, here's that guy's yacht. I should go to the Guardia Seville and ask them to seize those yachts. And one of them was seized. Um, Putin had his yacht was being built in Hamburg, Germany. And 10 days ago, they uh, tugboats came and took it and got it underway and are bringing it to St. Petersburg right now. You know, I mean, so they are propping it up. This is the only thing that's holding them. How can they hurt the United States? They can't. That's why Putin made all these saber rattling noises about atomic bombs, you know? Let me ask uh, Remy to say a few words. Before Wait, what is this? Biden mm -hmm. announced US will close skies Russian aircraft? No, close our skies to Russian aircraft. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. In advance Wait, of the state of the You want to be Russian and you want to be a dictator and an oligarch? Live in Russia alone with your money that is worthless now. And, you know, you can't even, you, you can't go buy your croissants in Marseille. Okay, let me ask uh, Remy uh, Adekoya to uh, say a couple of uh, words in response. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in the UK now, where it's 1 a.m. Oh, I'm and sorry, Remy. 
<laughs> no, 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 no problem. It's been it's been uh, fascinating listening uh, listening to. You. I mean, you've been there on the ground. Uh, my experience was basically as a journalist in Poland, so in that in that part of the world, we can uh -huh. see. Uh, I lived in Poland for 19 years and worked as a political journalist there. And obviously, you know, there's Polish media covers uh, always has always covered Putin much more closely than you know media here. So just a couple of thoughts I actually um, uh, had. First of all, I'm surprised uh, that Putin might not have expected Ukrainians to fight. Uh, yeah. This could actually say a lot about his state of mind here, because watching Polish media, for instance, in the run up in the past couple of weeks, everybody there knew the Ukrainians were going to fight. And anybody who knows anything about Ukraine's history, and especially their history of resistance, especially even of guerrilla warfare during the um, Second World War and, and, and all their, you know, and history, everyone knew the Ukrainians were going to fight. The public didn't, didn't need doubt. And, you know, the Russians know Ukrainian history also. So, you know, so the fact Putin might have thought otherwise does actually, you know, lend to that uh, theory that perhaps he isn't in full uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, he, he's in, in, in the best intellectual form right now. Uh, which is of course dangerous for all of us actually um so that's uh, that's one thought on that you know i also wonder about the so, geo you know larger geopolitical implications of all this so you know so where is all this going to lead to it's difficult to see how he just you know withdraws and accepts defeat especially if you say uh, you think he might lose because then he's pretty much done i think uh, in Russia, you know, he looks weak to the people around him. He looks weak to the Russian people. I mean, the Russian people then are like, you know, so what exactly did we get out of all this? And it's not like, you know, Russia is not North Korea. It's not a country where, you know, the citizens don't know what's going on. There isn't that kind of information shutdown there. You know, people have access to the internet, you know, definitely in the big cities. And those who live in the big cities, you know, they tell their grandmas and grandpas who live in the say, villages and towns, which where there might only be state TV, they tell them what's happening. And so it's not like people don't know what's happening. So it'll be interesting to see really, uh, you know, how he plays this and how he sort of saves face. I am a little bit concerned. I'm, you know, been mega pro uh, Ukraine sort of, you know, from the beginning, like I say, especially coming from that, you know, Polish perspective. But I am a bit concerned at how the West is pushing him. I do think he needs to be given a sort of way to somehow save face and get out of all this because if he is pushed to the sort of um, point where it's either he does something amazingly brutal and you know slaughter like a hundred thousand people or fifty thousand, or have to simply go back with his tail between his legs, I think he might pick you know the first option. Well, wait, and then the you, question what, is, what would be what would be, what would you recommend that that we offer or that the United States offers so that he can save face? No, this would have to be, uh, you know, informal negotiations. Obviously, this would this shouldn't be anything public. Um, I expect that always during a war, there's always negotiations before the war, during the war, and after the war. So I do suspect, you know, um, uh, diplomats are speaking to him, and so you know, I, I can't say, I can't say, I, I have no idea, but I do think they do need to present something to him, you know, to give him some opportunity to be able to get out of this without feeling too desperate. Really, if, if he's losing, yeah, if he's losing, mm. what could the United States offer him if he's losing? They, they they want to wait and let that play out. It seems to me. Mm. Well, you know, the I don't I, I don't think the U.S. here is sort of the only you know major actor. Actually, a lot depends on Zelensky. A lot depends on what Zelensky might be prepared to offer for Putin to withdraw his troops or at least to withdraw them from a significant, you know, from most of Ukraine. So I think this really depends on him. If, you know, Putin sort of pushes forward and, you know, increases the bombing and civilians start fleeing, and even today, this evening, civilians start fleeing actually, um, at least we sort of report, uh, then, you know, Zelensky is also going to be in a tough spot. The question is, you know, how much pain uh, is he ready, you know, for his people to take and how much pain are his people ready to take? It does seem they're ready to take a lot, but, you know, we'll see, you know, if this drags on, you know, weeks, you know, things might change and the mood might change even well, among the Ukrainians. The more violence visited upon the uh, Ukrainian people, the less mm -hmm. palatable any kind of deal with Putin will be around the world, wouldn't you say? Around the world, probably, In yes. The West? In the West? Uh, Why would they put up with that? I mean, they're only going you to know. 
become more enraged uh, uh, by the, uh, these atrocities and brutality. That the Western public, yes. The public, yes. So people, you know, sitting on Twitter and tweeting about it, yes, definitely. But if we're talking about, you know, governments, Western governments, I do think they want the war to end. It's not really nobody this, you know, nobody sort of, you know, profiting from this or really it's not really working for anybody. I'm just saying, like I say, I'm just, you know, throwing it out there, trying to think of sort of, you know, what happens afterwards and how do we get to this without a huge sort of humanitarian disaster. So that's, you know, that's on, on, on one side. Um, on the racism side, um, uh, Malcolm sort of uh, talked about that a little bit. There have, I think, been, you know, quite numerous reports and I've definitely heard uh, from you know Nigerians and other Africans that they have you know been discriminated against there you know while trying to leave Ukraine CNN also did a report on that also but Indian students also you know complained about that and Ukrainians I know it's of course war and there's of course the fog of war and as Malcolm uh, rightly said the Russians quickly picked up on that and uh, and unsurprisingly uh, that definitely has resonated strongly within African circles, so in African social media. So, you know, because of that history, because that history is there, definitely of racism, not specifically from um, uh, Eastern Europeans, but definitely from Western Europeans, so ge generally from white people, as, uh, as Africans would see it. And so that's resonated very strongly, and the mood has swung, I'd say. So if you're talking about sort of the African constituency, uh, the Ukraine's house, I see are on the way to losing them, you know, however, however, um, uh, they may view the importance of, of that constituency. So at the beginning of the war, you know, sort of African social media was, you know, fully on Ukraine side, like everybody basically, you know, was supporting Ukraine. Just a few people were saying, oh, you know, maybe they shouldn't have pushed Russia too much. But now these reports have started, you know, coming out and they're, you know, they're all over Twitter. The mood has turned and people are like, oh, you know, why should we back uh, Remy, the Ukrainians wow. if they're being racist towards Remy, black people? Yeah. Real quick. You know, now that I've been there, I've seen those these people, uh, the Russians have effectively made this a good piece of propaganda and whoever was at the sure. border, they've all been ordered not to do that. And as mm. we see, somebody had mentioned, it was actually happening on the Polish and Hungarian border control sides, because some of these people may have left without their passports, mm. uh, you know, because they could have been up at, you know, they could have been at the consulate uh, office having new visas put in there. Um, mm. But look at it from the Ukrainian perspective, because I don't think they're going to care much because they are yeah. literally in an existential war. The country may oh. cease to exist. And mm. so I think that that, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I, I MSNBC, uh, a journalist asked me to comment on it. And I said, when you put this into the priorities, 42 million people subjugated versus a couple of hundred students who were at the safest border you could possibly be at in the country, having some, some cop up there, you know, pull, bully these people. I don't think in the big scheme of things, this is an issue. I, I definitely, because things are about to get horribly, horribly worse for the 42 million white people that are there. So if the Nigerians think this is Pry one, they're going to quickly find themselves as isolated as the Russians are. Wow. No, I have no, I have no doubt. I mean, I'm sort of, you know, talking about this because we are in a sort of a, a collection of uh, mostly black or people of color and um, journalists here. I have no doubt. Like I, I lived in 19 years. I know Eastern Europeans don't really care what black people think about them, you know. So I have no illusions about that. So uh, in that sense, they're not even like the Western Europeans who, you know, who care or at least pretend to care. They don't care. So, you know, I'm not, I have no illusions about that. I'm just telling you that since we are journalists of color, you know, I would assume we do care. And so that's why, um, that's why I'm bringing up that issue here. And so, you know, so that's that. Um, so, yeah, those were the main, um, uh, so those were the main points. So for me, like I say, you know, key is, you know, okay, what next, you know? And uh, how is all this going to play sort of um, uh, geopolitically? You know, what's China going to do? I mean, China, you know, increased the gas deal they had with uh, Russia just before the war. And most probably, you know, Putin is going to be heavily dependent on China now for economic survival uh, with all these sanctions, which is probably going to give, you know, obviously China um, a leverage over, uh, over him. Um, so we'll see if that's, you know, if China is going to get to play the sort of, you know, 
mediating actor now. I think, I, I don't know whether it was the foreign minister or some high rest of today and said uh, China would like to mediate in the crisis. Um, so probably if anyone uh, could have influence on, on Putin, uh, I could imagine it would be the Chinese government because I don't see who else can sort of, you know, save him economically uh, if this war goes on and the sanctions um, uh, continue for long. So there's also that, um, uh, there's also the China factor there. So yeah, so we'll, we'll see how- I want to ask Yangwan uh, uh, Kang here uh, if he has any thoughts about that, that mm. he's familiar with that part of the world. Good evening, everybody. I think the people in East Asia are paying a lot of attention to this because um, Russia just set a precedence for a war uh, based on whatever claim that one side makes. And that's exactly what's happening with the Communist Chinese Party uh, of the People's Republic of China on the mainland uh, versus the Republic of China, which is Taiwan. And, and you know, the, as far as the Communist Party is concerned, they never wanted any American troops on Taiwan like we have American troops in South Korea right now, because Taiwan would be a, like a aircraft carrier that never sinks if Americans end up there. Mm -hmm. Whereas some Americans now have to be on an aircraft carrier hovering around in the Pacific Ocean just to keep their eye on China. But they're already doing that through the world's largest US military base in South Korea, outside of the United States, um, where they run all their reconnaissance and their, their watch on Chinese activities, as well as North Korea and Russia, all from um, Osan Air, Air Force Base in, in South Korea. So now it's in Pyeongtaek. Um, so um, there's a lot of, lot of um, uh, keen interest on this. And South Korean presidential election is happening on March 9th in eight days, less, a little bit over a week from now. And during the very last debate, the candidates got involved and the, uh, the ruling party candidate said, uh, Ukrainian president, uh, was trying to rush himself into NATO too quickly, and 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 that that angered Putin. And on the other hand, um, the opposition party was 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 tricked into saying that well, if there's something like this on Korea, uh, where Chinese forces come in and help out North Korea or anything like that, any Russian or China helping North Korea, just like they did back in the Korean War. Are we gonna rely on US, Japan, Korean alliance to fight back? And then that opened the can of worms because the Koreans um, have no, absolutely no, no appetite for having Japanese forces on Korean land ever again after they were sent away in 1945 after 36 years of occupying uh, Korea. So, you know, this is, um, this is very sensitive sub subject. And of course, um, Chinese Communist Party have, you know, a vested interest in keeping their fingers on all of East Asia because they lost 1.4, 1.5 million people in the Korean War. That's how many we killed. Um, well, and that's why they were that maybe China might be a, the mediator that can resolve this conflict. <laughs> uh, and, well, I think they're they're going to look for legitimacy and 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 legal precedents for going in, um, not necessarily mediate anything because Chinese Communist Party lacks credibility to do anything just according to the world uh, expectations or standards. They don't abide by the, the, the Geneva Conventions. They don't abide by United Nations rules. Mm -hmm. They make their own, their own rules where they deploy their, uh, you know, their manpower or their military to, do, to pursue their strategic interest of trying to get to the South uh, uh, China Sea 
to get to the um, uh, Middle East through uh, countries in between. And, and they, you know, they, they've had some skirmishes along Indian border um, not too long ago, actual fighting between some soldiers with India. So, you know, they got, they got their hands full right now. And they now. don't have the credibility you're saying. No, be... no, no. Okay. No. Can I make so, a point? Yeah. Um, yes, another thing about the Chinese that I, I think is playing out here with Russia, since Putin had to have at some point intimated to Xi that he was going to do this. And the Chinese already had a copy of the plan. Remember, the United States shared it with them. The Chinese tend to play long ball here. And one of the things that I think that they could, would, would certainly, you would have to know is that if Russia has ta takes Ukraine, every centimeter of that infrastructure has to be rebuilt, right? All the radio, telephone, all the television, all the materials in that country, which has, by the way, 77 years to reconstruct Ukraine to where it is today. Putin is now dismantling everything that's been done since 1945, literally like blowing up apartment blocks. So the Chinese would benefit greatly in the reconstruction of that country. I worked with, you know, my wife worked with Chinese uh, construction companies. She had 50,000 Pakistani workers. And the Chinese were quietly replacing, you know, them with 25,000 Pakistani or Chinese workers who would just come in, have their own self-made uh, construction compounds, and you would never see them. Wouldn't see them at the malls, wouldn't see them anywhere. They were just living their world. So China might have benefit, might still benefit from the reconstruction of Ukraine. Uh, or if it gets worse, okay. reconstruction of, uh, you know, Russia. <laughs> Wow. All right. I want to, I want to, you, you brought up Malcolm earlier in the, uh, about the media coverage and the flaws. And uh, I wanted to turn to uh, Rasha uh, Elas, who uh, was, had some comments about the media coverage. There've been a slew of stories about um, uh, insensitive uh, and quasi-racist coverage in the West, uh, comparing the coverage of Ukraine versus coverage of conflicts in other, other parts of the world. But you also pointed out that it is true that Ukraine is much more like the United States and the West than the other, um, uh, other places. So um, uh, let's, let's hear from uh, Russia. Are you there? Russia, you're not there? Okay, all right. Well, we won't talk about that. No, I'm right. here. I'm here. Oh, you are here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just having some issues. Sorry. Okay. Um, yes, tell me. Well, and also I'll point out that the, that the Middle Eastern, I think it's the Middle Eastern and Arab Journalists Association here in the U.S., they issued a strong statement saying they thought the coverage was racist in the United States. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, the comments that came out were you know, as you saw my quote in the Washington Post were quite, were in a way shocking and in a way not so shocking because, you know, working in the field, we kind of would come across that a lot and also uh, following media coverage of uh, Middle East news since I started in journalism with the Iraq war, um, which was why I went into journalism was how the legacy media in the US was covering the Iraq war the, Iraq, the US invasion of Iraq was, um, uh, I mean, it was, uh, you know, there were a lot of blind spots. There wasn't a lot of diversity in the reporters who were covering the stories. There was um, just sort of no nuance, just, uh, I don't know, um, maybe I'm the oldest person here, I don't know, but I do remember shock and awe. Um, and uh, you know the CNN footage of the uh, of the light show over over Baghdad, and uh, I mean all those things very dehumanizing. Um, so so yeah. So when so when reporters today look at the uh, conflict or the you know Ukraine, and they're like, oh my gosh, these people are just like us, and and this and that, and you know, it's, it's, um, 
It's a little bit shocking because I thought we moved past it. I thought we moved beyond it. And I thought, I thought there was a little bit of nuance and a little bit of diversity in that, you know, sort of um, journalism and the profession was moving in the right direction. Um, but. Since then, and I do think, and I do think we ha we have been moving in the right direction. I mean, may maybe not as fast as we should be, and we're nowhere near where we need to be, um, and where we could be. Um, but yeah, that's my two cents. Thank you, thank you. Anybody have any observations? Other observations about yeah. the media coverage? Can, can I ask what what the specific racism um, that people are observing in the coverage? Is it juxtaposing it against like Middle Eastern coverage? Which of course well, is no, Malcolm, a lot of the several pieces of the coverage, CBS, I think there's a list today on face, Facebook. Mm. Uh, uh, journalist, white journalist, uh, referring to how terribly awful it is to see all of this violence in a nice European country like <laughs> as opposed to some of the <laughs> women Places like Africa and Afghanistan. Has been They've even was that, but having reported, yeah, I'm on for both the Washington Star and National Public Radio, I'm here to tell you, white people who who are foreign correspondents for the U.S. in general tend to be some very racist people, mm. and they are, they are supporting and advancing white supremacy. They don't they're they're not there with any sensitivity to to certainly people of color in places that they're deployed. And so this is just par for the course, nothing new here. Yeah, they've even used terms like civilized and uncivilized. Um, I think the one reporter had to apologize where he said, you know, I know I have to choose my words carefully, but it, yeah, they seem they it's in a civilized place. I'm thinking, well, wow, what if he didn't choose his words carefully? <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that I, I, I saw that video and actually that was fascinating because it actually shows even within whiteness, there's hierarchies of whiteness. Because he said, <laughs> he said the words he used, he said, oh, he said, uh, Ukraine is a relatively civilized, relatively European nation. So what? it's not, you know, it's not, yeah, that's what he said. This, this video you're talking about, if you listen to it well, he says he Ukraine, you know, he said relatively, it's a, it's a relatively civilized, <laughs> you know, all there, <laughs> not yet <laughs> there, you know, so, sort of almost white. Um, but it's <laughs> a, a relatively European, he said. So it's not, you know, not fully European, but it's almost there, you know. So there's even, there's hierarchies, you know, you see even within that, uh, within that whiteness. So there's the Western whiteness civilized and there's the Eastern European, you know, less civilized whiteness. So that was um, uh, that was fascinating. And in the Telegraph, I think had a, had a terrible piece really where the lead sort of, you know, on there, at least which they, which they tweeted out was, oh, the reason why this is so shocking for us is because you know it's not happening in some remote impoverished region of the world, but it's happening to people who look like us. I mean, that was actually written there. It was in, in the Telegraph piece, you know. You know, so, I'm, so yeah. I'm gonna follow that up with, I tweeted about two weeks ago, and, mm. uh, and I said this on the Stephanie Miller radio show. At some point when images of poor, oh, not poor, but of blonde haired, white Caucasian children are dead mm -hmm. in the streets mm -hmm. and people are walking around bloodied, the, the, the perception of this war is going to change for Donald Trump supporters. Mm -hmm. Because up to this point, it was like Putin, yay. And now it's like, whoa, whoa, nine-year-old bl blonde haired kid who dyed her hair pink was killed in a shelling with her parents and her children. And they see it in themselves. Whereas look, I went, I went, I fought in the Middle East wars my entire career. Every war that we fought there was just straight up racist. They were non-entities, you know? Oh, a hundred thousand Iraqis died in the invasion. It's like, what, 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 what? You know, not here now to, you know, they say 167 civilians. When those real pictures start coming out there and the Ukrainians are gonna start putting them out um, with lots of dead women and children, when the mm -hmm. Russians really get brutal, then you're gonna, they're gonna claim that Joe Biden's abandoning white people in Europe. Yeah. It's gonna yeah. be a flip-flop of, of yeah. enormous magnitude. Tucker Carlson's already yeah. done it. 
Wow. Yep. Definitely. 100%. 100%. I've noticed that sometimes they don't even consider Ukraine Europe. They'll say Ukraine and Europe. And I'm mm. like, well, Ukraine is in Europe. Last time oh, I looked yeah. the map. Yeah. I, I hear that all the time on the news. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. look, with, with, with all fair, I mean, with all fairness, you know, I mean, neuroscience says that we, you know, instinctually identify with people that look like us or whatever. And I have to admit, for example, uh, you know, when I was covering wars in the Middle East, when I heard Arabic, I mean, forget, forget the looks, because, you know, people in the Middle East look all sorts of things, all sorts of ways. But when I heard Arabic, because it's my native language, it's a, it's a visceral, it's, you know, it's emotional. I mean, you're moved, you're devastated. You're actually devastated. Um, you know, so, I mean, I get that, but what I don't get is, oh, and those are civilized and those are not civilized. You know, I get the uh, also relating to Ukrainians as uh, Westerners, not necessarily as white people, but yeah, they're Westerners and there's a metro and they're fleeing with their cat, yeah. you know, here's, yeah, here's yeah. the cat, you know. Yeah, they're um, like the us, cat yeah. In, in the carrier, <laughs> yeah, and you know, all those things, I get all that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to relate to that scenario than to a different scenario in a developing country that is indeed impoverished, where you, you can't imagine being that poor when you're living, you know, here. So I, I get that, but, but I, I just don't get, you know, come on. I mean, how can you think, you know, along the lines of civilized and uncivilized and thinking that it's actually okay to say that. That's- Identification that's is whiteness. Well, forget Western, mm -hmm. forget, Western <laughs> forget European. It's yeah, so. yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that's apparent, exactly. Also, when I got, <laughs> when, when I saw all of these reporters influxing into the country in the last week before the invasion, uh, you know, because they were all setting up in the intercon, right? Um, all of these guys were there were like, there's no stories here. There's no war here. They expected to see Sarajevo, all right, in the early 2000s, a destroyed Eastern European city, or a city that looked more like Boston City Hall, <laughs> this big, gray, brutalist, ugly you know, that's, by the way, is the most Ukraine, you know, the most Eastern European building in the United States. But what they found was a city that was more on par with Austria or Germany or France. And they were immediately got into the drinks and restaurants culture. And I've said this on air too. The hardest thing to do in the run up to this war is figuring out which restaurant and bar you were going to that night. And these guys were like, well, how do I wear my body armor? <laughs> it's like, wait for a bomb to drop, and then you can get out of your speakeasy, and, uh, and you can start reporting like you're in trouble. But up to that day that that bomb dropped, those guys were bored and were hunting for stories. And they couldn't mm -hmm. come up with nothing other than, will cafe society survive a Russian invasion? <laughs> <laughs> Or, 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 or the classic thing of quoting the cab driver because like because there's no story and you're not interviewing anybody yeah. except oh, you're in a cab your, going back your to your total, hotel from the bar you know <laughs> the <laughs> full <laughs> thomas friedman right and yeah. by the way uber <laughs> drivers thomas. over there you have to have uber in big letters across the side of the car so you know there's taxis and uber so it, yeah. it, it was a big disappointment for many of them to arrive in a city that was more like Brooklyn than Sarajevo in 2001 or, two, you know. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of which, when it comes to um, also, you know, uh, Ukrainians being perceived as white, European, civilized, it's not just about that, but it's also um christian i mean you know bosnians are european and they're white it's not the same reaction at all and and it's not the same reaction within europe also to bosnians i mean you know, you know they're when, white but they're yeah. european but they're muslim when i went to bosnia uh during the bosnian war uh as a u.s military person uh, who specialized in the middle east 
uh, I was asked to give a brief about it. And they were like, what's the difference between the Serbs and the Bosniaks and the, and the Croatians? And I said, Christians that don't go to church and Muslims that don't go to mosque. <laughs> that was it. That's it. They all drink Slivovitz. Okay, there you go. Bosnia. But all right, well, let me, let me, let me, let me uh, uh, stop us for a minute here so we can get to our introduction. So the State of the Union address starts in half an hour. So let's quickly go through and tell everybody who's here. Uh, Kenny Walker, who are you? Uh, yes, well, uh, retired now, starting at the Washington Star, going to ABC News, from there to National Public Radio, to back in the United States, where I never expected to be. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Roger Witherspoon. Unmute, please. There you go. Hi, everybody. Um, 60 years in journalism, um, radio, television, and print, and now I'm semi-retired. Okay, Sharon yeah, Farmer, Farmer, our photographer. Power to the people, people to the power. Yes, Southeast. <laughs> How you doing, Sharon? All right, Diana Fuentes. Unmute, please. Unmute. Uh, I'm so sorry. Diana Fuentes, Didi. I'm a executive director of IRE and another great round table, Richard. This has been fantastic. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Betty Ann Williams. Unmute, please. Bad timing. Malcolm, thanks. It's wonderful to have you back again. Betty Ann Williams, a longtime member of the round table and a longtime Washington journalist. Okay, Chuck Stevens. Unmute, please. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, an adjunct professor at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism and an independent writer formerly with Bloomberg News and the Wall Street Journal. Okay, Debbie Harrison. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm someone, DC native, who uh, started in newspapers in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, Philadelphia Bureau, Wall Street Journal, and American Metal Market News. Uh, 20 plus years in uh, trade and professional association communications, including being oh, the we first gotta, we communications gotta Speed director. it up, speed it up. <laughs> okay, no, 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 it was last, last title, Richard. Okay. I was the first communications director of NABJ. All right, thank you. Rod Hicks. Hey, I'm uh, uh, the director of ethics and diversity at the Society of Professional Journalists. All right, thank you, Rod. Good to see you again. All right, young one. Hi, I spent 10 years with LA Times in the West Coast and last uh, 23 years in the East Coast with AP Reuters. And I'm currently working on a visual history of Korea project, um, introducing Korean history and culture civilization to the English world through my pictures and my columns. I have, I have a weekly column that comes out in the Korea Herald English newspaper um, which is a full page spread that you can look. All right. And uh, uh, Young Wan also, uh, as he said on Sunday at our round table, uh, this is the part of the world that uh, people don't uh, understand very much about. In fact, uh, we had, when we talked about, uh, when Chester Higgins was talking about the ancient Nile region, and I made the comment that, uh, yeah, while we, what we basically hear about in the ancient world is Greece and Rome. A uh, young one said, yes, not to mention Asia was around too and we don't hear about what's going on there. So there you go, yeah. there's a lot that we can learn. Lynn Adrian, I'm sorry, Joe Davidson. I'm, I'm a columnist with the Washington Post, the founder of the National Association of Black Journalists and I was formerly a Washington and a South African correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. All right, Lynn Adrian. I'm a I'm a board member for journalisms. I yes. I'm the executive, the executive uh, director of the uh, Washington D.C. Capstone Program uh, in broadcast and digital journalism for the Newhouse School at uh, Syracuse University. Longtime uh, senior producer for network television news before that. Okay, thank you, Jill Geisler. Hi, I'm the Bill Platt Chair in Leadership and Media Integrity at Loyola University Chicago. I um, lead the Freedom Forum's Power Shift Project and I, with Alfredo Carbajal, I co-lead the News Leaders Association's Emerging Leaders Institute for Diversity, Equity. What's and the Power Shift Project? 
PowerShift project was is a initiative of the Freedom Forum that tackles harassment, discrimination, and incivility in newsrooms and offers free training to provide that. All right, thank you, thank you, Jill. Craig Herndon. Hello, uh, Craig Herndon, 32 years at the Washington Post, photojournalist, 11 years in the journalism department at Howard University. Okay, Benita Bing. I mute Benita. Benita. <laughs> The roles are reversed. Unmute, please. Yeah, you caught me off guard, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Benita Bing, uh, president of the Exposure Group, African American Photographers Association here in Washington, D.C. Also the owner of the uh, Talbert and Bing uh, Studios in Northeast D.C. And uh, the producer of uh, The Roundtable. Thank you, thank you, Benita. Thank you. She sure is. Mary Curtis, Mary C. Curtis. Yeah, Mary C. Curtis, columnist at Roll Call, host of the Equal Time podcast, facilitator for the Op-Ed Project, and contributor to the Black News Channel, formerly New York Times. Okay, Beatrice McBride, second timer. Unmute, please. I'm Beatrice McBride. I'm based in Dallas, Texas. I'm a freelance photographer. I'm a director of photography for the Denton Black Film Festival in Denton, Texas. Okay, thank you. Ishmael Reed. I'm the publisher of Conch Magazine. We started out as a print edition in 1991. We went uh, online. You can get it at conch.com, ishmaelreedpub.com. And my daughter is a managing editor, Tennessee Reed. And uh, we put out the magazine with our own money, quarterly. All right, thank you, thank you. Bruce Johnson. Uh, new question tonight. Uh, retired recently after 45 years, uh, reporter, anchor at the CBS station in Washington, D.C. Um, a memoir, my book of all those years, uh, just dropped about a week ago. It's called uh, Surviving Deep Waters. Here, here. And where can they get it? Anywhere online, uh, your favorite bookstore, but certainly everywhere online. All right, thank you, Bruce. Right. Tennessee Reed, you were just introduced by your dad. Yes, I'm a writer, editor, and photographer. I'm the managing editor of Conch Magazine and the secretary and chairperson of Penn Oakland. Of what? Oh, Penn Oakland, okay. Gotcha, thank you, thank you. Uh, Nolu, Nolu Crockett, Tonga. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm a social entrepreneur, Pan-African communication specialist. Spent 10 years in Africa, South Africa, first as a journalist in public affairs, a consultant to members of Nelson Mandela's cabinet, among others. Also spent years in Cameroon, and I am a former NPR correspondent. Here, here. Okay. Uh, is, that, is that Gloria? Yes. All right. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, make it out. All right, please. Gloria Minot, all right, Gloria Minot, formerly of Pacifica, WPFW Radio. Thank you. I can hardly hear you. Oh, Jean Meyer. Uh, Jean Meyer, 34 years at the Washington Post. Uh, worked with Craig Herndon, among other great <laughs> photographers there during our time. Uh, author of Five for Freedom, the African American Soldiers in John Brown's Army. Uh, it looks like a memorial plaque to um, one of the five, Dangerfield Newby and Harriet Newby, will be erected in Culpeper County sometime this spring. Uh, the, uh, the new That's governor in so far in Virginia, so far the new governor has not canceled it. And uh, <laughs> we hope that it uh, th that uh, goes through. We expect it to. So that's yeah. exciting. Like to hear, uh, always like to hear Malcolm Nance. And I'd like to hear about everybody else much more interesting than myself. <laughs> Thank you, Gene. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, you are ship. Hello, everybody. It's been a fascinating conversation. I'm a veteran of newspapers, New York Times, New York Daily News, formerly ombudsman at the Washington Post. Uh, now I uh, do some freelancing and I am a Professor of Journalism at Morgan State University. Here, here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joel Dreyfus. Unmute, please. Hi. I had a 50 year career in journalism, worked at the Washington Post, Fortune Magazine, Tokyo Bureau Chief in 
for several years. And now I spend my time between New York and Paris writing a book. All right, here, here. Okay, Todd Stephen Burroughs. Todd Stephen Burroughs, uh, currently news editor of the Black World Media Network. Wanted to point out uh, today is Harry Belafonte's 95th birthday. And uh, on our site, we have a radio uh, tribute to him if you want to check that out. Okay, thank you, Todd. Uh, Barbara Reynolds. I'm Barbara Reynolds. I have 60 years of journalism, Encore, Ebony, um, Chicago Tribune. I was on the editorial board of USA Today. Um, I write now for the Trice Eddie Newswire. And I write books. I've written eight books. The one people know most about is my book uh, on the memoirs of Coretta Scott King. But I'm almost finished with my ninth book. My ninth book which is called The Rise of the Techno-Messiah and the End Times. Oh my goodness. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jackie Jones. So I am the Dean of the School of Global Journalism and Communication at Morgan State University in Baltimore, longtime journalist, longtime member of the Roundtable, DC native, worked with about half the people on this uh, call tonight. <laughs> and, uh, um, have really enjoyed this discussion. It's been very informative. Excellent, excellent. All right, Karen Dunlap. Former president of the Pointer Institute and, and author of two books. And Jill Geis, was good to see you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, Gabrielle Gurley. Gabrielle Gurley, senior editor at the American Prospect Magazine. You can check us out at prospect.org. All right, Bala Baptiste. Richard, outstanding work as usual. Hello, everybody. Thank you. My name is Bala Baptiste. I'm chair, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Division of Communications and professor at Miles College near uh, near Birmingham. And, and I'm really happy that I just published uh, an article in the journal American History. Um, and that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Dorian Bethay. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, Doreen Bethea, multi-platform editor at the Washington Post, which means I'm a copy editor. I've been reading and editing a lot of these stories out of Russia, about Russia and Ukraine, formerly a reporter at the Richmond Times-Dispatch and an assistant county editor at the Orlando Sentinel. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Doreen, thanks for being here. Elliot Francis. Elliot. Your microphone is, uh, I guess you need to unmute. Okay, we'll move on to El Eleanor Vega. Hi, Richard. That was a fantastic round table. Really insightful and thought provoking. Um, well, we'll have to give ourselves a hand for that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm a long time a journalist, worked in both local and network, Spanish and English, spent 23 years at CBS News, was the um, LA uh, West Coast Bureau Chief. I'm now a freelance journalist and currently the SPJ Diversity and Inclusion Committee Chair. Thank you for the All invitation. Right. Well, thank you for being here. Okay, so we have 15 minutes before the State of the Union. So uh, anybody have any final thoughts before we uh, close? I do. Um, okay. Malcolm, yeah, Malcolm was saying that he thought Russia might actually lose this fight. How is um, are, are the Ukrainians going to adopt the, the the tactics that Hezbollah used to thwart the Israelis, or, or what do you see? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, first, actually, I think that the Ukrainian army itself has the capacity to defeat the, the Russian army on the field of battle now, even if they're being pressured. One of the things we're finding about the Russians is they're not leaving the highway. The roads are terrible. They're terrible. The, not the roads, the, the fields. Uh, we've already seen pictures of T-80 main battle tanks up to the turrets in mud. And then another tank that was wow. pulling them out got stuck also as an artillery piece. Uh, so anything that can maneuver around that, even if it's light force is, that can get in the Russian rear, can wreak havoc. The Ukrainians know how to maneuver. I suspect that they're going to let the Russians come in for a little while. They're going to fight for every centimeter. They're going to wear them down. And then 
you can just tear around and come through their rear and you can literally destroy their army. Uh, and it's about destroying their logistics units, not their tanks. Tanks without fuel are just giant paperweights. If Ukraine, you know, and I think that this war could go well on over a year, um, if they could take Kiev, which I, I also doubt that they could take it and hold it, um, then what you're going to see is the entire country devolve into Hezbollah. They will not be Russian soldiers who are sitting at their tanks at the crossroad will not be able to trust any white person that comes up to them because you don't know whether they're going to drop off an explosive, throw a hand grenade, a Molotov cocktail, and just like Lebanon uh, and Syria and Iraq and Libya and Afghanistan, the, the Ukrainians are already planning on making the highways the most dangerous place in, in the country with roadside bombs, IEDs. They're not going to use suicide bombers, but they could use robotic vehicle bombs. Uh, they're going to make the Russians pay. And the Russians won't be able to sustain the losses. OK, uh, Joe Davidson had a question as well. Uh, yes, Malcolm, what is the role of the CIA in Ukraine now? And for other feds, the diplomats, um, are they all in either Lviv or, or back in DC and what are they doing? Yeah, good question. And uh, thanks for forming the NABJ, appreciate that. <laughs> so um, it's a good it question. <laughs> First off, all US diplomats uh, two weeks ago left. They were in Lviv, they all went to Warsaw. There is no US representation in country uh, in the run, because they did that in the run up of the combat campaign. They thought Lviv would start getting hit too. Uh, the CIA, who knows, right? I thought um, you know. But, <laughs> <laughs> if I did know, I wouldn't tell you. Uh, I'd be out working. So um, one thing that I did hear that I was a little disappointed with and that I thought, you know, if I had two minutes with President Biden, I'd give him a, 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 a piece of my mind, is that um, there is in this particular White House, you know, there's all sorts of wonder kuns in there, right? You have Jake right. Sullivan who's in his 30s and everything. Um, they're all really sort of formalized into procedure in the old way that the White House was done. So things don't get to Biden as they should. And one of those was um, carrying out and supporting a clandestine operation to provide Ukraine with more weapons um, with more weapons and equipment and all that stuff. Um, they say that the, from what I'm hearing of, of ex-CIA people, this White House is very reluctant. And it's not the president. It's all these young people in the National Security Council who never really served in the military or clandestine service or would understand the value of helping the Ukrainians run a full-scale resistance. So um, I hope that's not true, but you know, from what I've seen of this National Security Council, it's probably more true than not. And that is just not gonna fly, especially when you have the European Union saying, come to Poland, take our MiG-29s, fly back and start doing airstrikes. <laughs> you know, what are, what's our excuse? You know, that we, we don't want any Americans in there. Well, Americans are already in there. There's 30,000 Ukrainian American dual citizens. Okay. Can I just uh, say I one thing, to... Richard? I'm sorry? Yeah, can I just say one thing? Yes, please. Yeah, so one final thought, just, you know, to the state of mind of Putin. I read a very interesting um, article a couple of weeks ago, which essentially said, if you really want to understand uh, Putin, think Dostoevsky, not Marx. So it's not really, obviously, about setting up any kind of communist um, uh, union or even a Soviet union. It's an almost, you know, it's it's a almost messianic belief in this sort of messianic role of Russia in this sort of pan-Slavic world or pan-Slavic empire, which he'd like to, uh, which he'd like to, which he'd like to build. So it's it's gone into those kind. It's gone into it's it's into that kind of territory. And I heard even there was also I think someone I read I think so, this was someone from his circle was quoted as saying he's recently very much into esoteric mysticism. They say. Yeah. And so he's really gone, yes, so he's really gone off, of, you know, I, I don't want to say off the rails, but there's really, you know, it, it, it's not a sort of cold calculating, you know, as we may think. And, you know, he's 69 years old. So who knows, maybe he thinks, you know, he's going to lay everything on the line. 
and, you know, retire somewhere. I don't know. I mean, I'm just speculating. But I sort of really like that um, idea of, you know, think Dostoevsky, not Marx, and think Russian mysticism um, uh, rather than some, you know, terribly cold, you know, pragmatic um, calculation right here, but actually something something more messianic, you know, potentially. Well, that's another, another trait that he has in common with Hitler. Mm -hmm. This is yep. like 1939 yep. all over again. Yep. Wow. Let me let me uh, introduce, uh, let uh, James Blue introduce himself too. I forgot somebody. Now, James uh, was at, at uh, PBS and before that, the BET, and we toasted him. Charlie Hunter Galt came in to toast him when he got his new job, which is leading the Smithsonian Channel and other parts of Viacom CBS. So I already now introduced Paramount. Him, James. <laughs> Uh, hi, thanks everyone. And but really, um, the bulk of my career, uh, I was a um, foreign um, producer and correspondent for ABC News. And I worked for Ted Koppel, and there, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, all over the world. And um, I really appreciated this roundtable. It was really, really well done. And uh, thank you for putting it together. And uh, thank you for. Uh, sharing your thoughts, Mr. Dance. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And James, of course, was uh, egging me on all during this process, so he, he shouldn't leave himself out for the, for the congratulations and thanks. Okay, so nine minutes to the State of the Union, uh, so we better cut this off and let you get a break before you watch the president. Uh, thank you, everyone. We will be having another roundtable, our, our regular roundtable for March, which I believe will be March 20th, a Sunday afternoon. And you saw Hank Klivenoff of, Ember, of Emory University here at the last round table, formerly um, uh, an editor of the Atlanta Journal and Constitution, a co-author of the book called The Race Beat, which is about uh, covering the civil rights movement. He'll be here with his students who are from Emory who are investigating the cold cases, the never solved cases from the civil rights movement. So uh, come back for that. And uh, thank you, everyone. Um, if you have any more questions, uh, you can just ship me. And then we'll, there, is, there is the chat box, of course, and I'll be sending that out uh, later this evening to those who are here. And if anybody on Facebook would like to see it, they can just email me and I'll be glad to provide that. So thanks very much, everybody. Great time you, and uh, glad you were here. And I hope to see most of you uh, later on this month. Right. Thank, Thank you, Richard. Thank you. 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 Thank you.